Hello, this is Deborah Kreider. Um, I'm a professor for your this OB component for newborn adaptations, which is primarily dealing with the physical assessment of the newborn baby. So this will be entitled The Normal Newborn and Your Handout. I want to stop and take a minute to say thank you. Thank you for being a student in my class and being willing to learn about moms and babies. I want to remind you that I am more than willing to help you um, in many aspects of learning this content, but I want to remind you that I need you to help me help you. So I need you to do your part by studying and learning this information so that you can be prepared to take care of little babies like this one. The content that you are learning is based on course objectives and here are the course objectives for which this content is built. I'm not going to go over every single one of them, but just to kind of help you understand that um, we're not, I'm not just pulling this information out of the air. It is built on the, the course objectives for this course. Um, you're going to learn, for example, how to assess the physiological changes to the newborn as it experiences to adapt to extra uh, uterine life. Um, it's also known as external uterine life. Both terms are acceptable and interchangeable. Um, you're going to learn to assess the normal physical appearances, reflexes, and neurological char characteristics of the term newborn baby. And you're going to learn to discriminate amongst your assessment findings, which things are okay um, and are normal variations or what things do I need to, you know, report to the pediatrician. So these are just a few of the course objectives, but there are a few more here that this content is built on. So I want to begin um, by looking at the regionalization of a perinatal care. I know that you learned this in your welcome a breeze uh, it was an introduction to maternal care. It also is in the appendices portion of your syllabus. But when you look at um, the normal newborn nursery, there are levels of care. You're probably very familiar with hearing like um, a, a trauma one or um, level one trauma care in the in the healthcare community. And I want you to know what that means for the adult is that that is the highest level of care. But in, in an OB land and when you're caring for newborn babies and, and moms, it's actually the opposite. So your lowest level of care would be like a level one facility. So this is a basic community hospital. Um, they're basically taking care of healthy moms and healthy babies. A level two facility is they can take care of the same moms and babies that a level one facility can, but they may be able to, like if the baby has a small complication or it may need, you know, a, a, an extra couple days in the newborn nursery, maybe it needs a little bit of time in an isolate, but it doesn't need to be intubated. It doesn't need, um, you know, it just may need some additional respiratory support, but not necessarily a full intubation a level two facility can handle that. A level three facility, and up until recently that was the top level, um, is a full-fledged, fully staffed neonatal intensive care unit. Um, a level three facility can take care of the same babies that a level one or level two uh, facility can, but in addition, if the baby has some major complications, like let's say they're born preterm and they need to be put on a ventilator or they um, have had some complications adapting to external uterine life and they need a lot more intense supportive care, a level three can facilitate um, taking care of them. There's very little difference between a level three and a level four facility. Um, they primarily take care of the same patients. The only difference is in a level four facility, if you if the baby had like an unusual cardiac defect and needed a specialized type of surgery, then it would be done at a level four facility. So it's not that a level three facility isn't a high level of care. They're a very high level of care. It just means if the baby needs something that's really complicated or extremely specialized, then they would need to go to a level three facility. When you look at the normal newborn, the, the first thing you're going to want to try to remember is that the newborn is in a state of adjustment and the baby is adjusting from life inside the uterus to life outside the uterus. So this state of adaptation and adjustment is profound. 
all of their body systems are changing the way they receive and, and um, um, process oxygen it, it completely changes their circulatory system changes so the baby is in a state of adaptation or a state of adjustment from life inside the uterus to life outside the uterus when you look at this physiological and behavioral adaptation of the newborn um, it is extremely complex the amount of adaptation and and change the profound amount of change that they're they're um, undergoing the the baby for the first 28 days of life is called a neonate so that period of the first 28 days of life is known as the neonatal period um this is the time when they're transitioning to the external uterine life and that transition period um that the first portion of that transition period is a high amount of instability, especially after the first six to eight hours of birth. I usually tell students we watch them very closely that first 12 hours and of that first 12, the first six to eight are, are critical to making sure that they're transitioning well. That first phase of transition period lasts up to 30 minutes after birth and it is called the first period of reactivity. I start my physical assessment classes of the newborn with a joke with students and and this joke you see um, a very unusual couple at the nursery window making a statement come on the suspense is killing us which one of our which one's ours which baby is ours and you see this baby with a, a bag over its head now this is a funny joke but I usually bring this up to point to make a point to students. Not that I'm making fun of people by any means, but you're going to see some very unusual things when you are doing a newborn assessment. And what you want to store in the back of your mind is this baby comes from a gene pool. And so sometimes when you're uh, doing a physical assessment and you're trying to question, is this normal or is this not normal? Is this a variation? Look at mom and dad because the baby may have have inherited certain traits from their parents. The newborn baby is going to undergo several different um, assessments um, and these different assessments um, th there's some distinctive things that set them aside from each other. Um, so this series of, of assessments, there's a difference in the timing and the type of assessment which is completed. And these assessments really help the healthcare team determine if the baby is adjusting to external uterine life um, or if they need further intervention. So the very first assessment that the newborn baby undergoes is what's called an APGAR score or an APGAR assessment. And it is an assessment that is based on the name is uh, was given by a doctor who d developed this her name was uh, Virginia Apgar um, but it's an acronym which stands for activity pulse grimace appearance and respirations however I I tend to use um, it's the same thing but I use more of a uh, a system that explains to you what each indicator is and what you're looking for. So if you look on your screen here, you see the APGAR um, acronym, which stands for Activity, Pulse, Grimace, Appearance, and Respiration. I, I tend to use this one more to the left of your screen because I think students understand it a little bit more. But the first thing you're going to look at is you have some indicators and at the top is a scoring system. So you have 0, 1, and 2 and those scores follow all the way down the column. So the first indicator you're going to look at is your heart rate. Is the baby's heart rate there? If there is no heart rate or if the heart rate is absent, I'm going to give the baby a score of zero for that indicator. Or let's say the baby has a heart rate, but the heart rate is less than 100. That is not adequate for for uh, cardiopulmonary um, needs for a newborn baby. However, I'm still going to give them a score. So that score would be a one if it was below 100. If the score is above 100, which is very good for a newborn baby in their state of ad ad adaptation and transition, I'm going to give them a score for that indicator. Then you go to the next uh, group of, of assessment, and that's your respiratory uh, response. So do I have any type of respiratory effort from this newborn baby? Um, if I have no respiratory effort, like this baby isn't trying to breathe on its own, 
then I'm going to give them a score of, of absent for that indicator because they're not trying to breathe. Um, but let's say they have slow, irregular uh, um, respiratory effort, they have a weak cry, then I'll give them a one. Or if they're screaming their little heads off, you know, and they're breathing well, then I'm going to give them a two for that indicator. Then the third uh, indicator you'll see, or the third component to this assessment is their muscle tone. Newborn babies should have really good tone. And so if this baby is flaccid, if this baby is limp or floppy, um, I'm going to give them a score of zero for that indicator. But if the baby has some flexion in their extremities, they're not as flexed as they could be, but they have some flexion, I'll give them a score of one. If they have good amount of flexion, you know, and they're really active and they're moving their little arms and legs around, I'm going to give them a, a score of two for that indicator. Then I'm going to go to reflex irritability. It's the, the, the reflexive irritable response from this baby. So I'm going to try to stimulate this baby and see if I get any response. If they don't respond to me, you know, I'm vigorously drying them off and giving them a lot of tactile stimulation. If I don't get a response from this baby, um, for that indicator, I'm going to give them a zero. If I get a weak cry and just a little bit of, you know, some grimacing, then I will give them a one for that indicator. But if they're crying vigorously, they're coughing and sneezing and they're, you know, interacting with their environment, then I'm going to give them a two for that, for that indicator. And then the last indicator is I'm going to look at their skin color. Um, if the baby is blue, I'm going to give them a zero for that indicator. If they have some acrocyanosis, I will give them, um, a one. If they're pink, I'll give them a two. If they're pale, pale is considered the same as a blue. So I would give them a zero for that. So then you add these scores up. And um, if, you know, it, you're going to look at where, you know, they are. So you look at their scores, you know, heart rate, respiratory effort, muscle uh, tone, reflex, irritability, color, you're going to add all those scores up. The, the APGAR assessment is done at the one minute of birth time period and then five minutes time period. And then if the one and five minute aren't good, we're going to continue to repeat it in 10 minute intervals. So if the one minute and five minute um, APGARs are good, their scores are good, then they won't you know, continue to repeat them. And so you'll hear the nurses or the healthcare staff call them out. So they, you know, they'll, they may say APGAR scores eight and eight or, um, uh, eight and nine. They're, they're going to call them out. Um, and it's going to be documented in the newborn baby's chart. So your textbook varies on this just slightly, but this is kind of what you're going to see clinically. So a baby that is zero to three is going to need resuscitation. Okay. They're going to probably already be resuscitating this baby and not waiting, you know, a full one minute or full five minutes before we start to intervene. Um, but they're going to do some resuscitative measures for this baby if they are in the zero to three range. If they're four to six, and in reality, your textbook says four to seven, um, they may need some gentle stimulation, some um, supportive care. They may need some extra O2 in their environment, which we'll call, you'll hear the nurses call it blow by, which they hold an, o, an oxygen mask up to the baby's face. Um, and give them a little bit extra uh, oxygen uh, to help them as they transition into the external uterine environment. And then a score really of 8 to 10. There, we just continue to support them as their transition. There's no specific actions that we have to do. But again, APGAR scores are done at 1 and 5 minute intervals and then 10 minute intervals if the baby's first two APGAR scores are not good. So you're going to see a video link that I'm going to post at the end of this that uh, correlates to this. And it's, you see um, an APGAR score assessment being done. Let me give you a chance to apply. So a nurse observes that the newborn baby has a one minute APGAR score of five points. What should the nurse conclude from the observed APGAR score? And so you have A, B, C, or D in this choice. Which one would you choose? If you chose C, you are correct. 
the baby has a moderate difficulty in adjusting to external extra uterine life. Here's another chance to apply. I want you to score this. Baby girl Doe has a heart rate of 102 with slow irregular respirations. She grimaces when stimulated. She has some flexion in her extremities and her skin color is pale. What is her APGAR score? If you look at each of these, this is how this would be scored. She has a heart rate that's 102, so she would get two points for that. She has slow irregular respiration, so she would get one point for that. She grimaces when stimulated, that's one point. She has some flexion in her extremities, that's one point, and her skin color is pale. That would be zero, so her total APGAR score would be five. Here are some other videos that I'm going to post so that you can see what this looks like in action. The second set of assessments that the um, newborn baby undergoes, this is after the APGAR assessment, is what's called the nursing admission assessment. Now the admission assessment is different from your shift assessment. The admission assessment is a very thorough head-to-toe assessment where we're going to document every birthmark, you know, every, um, you know, if we find, you know, um, some type of injury or some type of abnormality, we're going to document that. And then after that admission assessment is complete, then we're going to um, shift to what's called a shift assessment, which is just a normal um head to toe assessment that we do every shift and we don't document every birthmark. Um, so we, the, the, the admission assessment is where we're going to spend the bulk of the time that we're going to talk about um, today. We're going to look at how the nurse completes this admission assessment and what different findings we may uh, have. So this admission assessment is a, phys a head to toe physical assessment. Then the nurse is also going to uh, observe and monitor how the baby is progressing in their adaptation. We're going to determine gestational age, which is another assessment, which is a Ballard assessment or gestational age assessment. And then we're going to continue to uh, assess for ongoing high risk problems. Then the baby is going to have a third assessment, which is completed within the first 24 hours of birth. It's an assessment that's completed by either the nurse midwife, a physician, or a nurse practitioner prior to discharge, and it's required that the baby is assessed before going home. It's usually done at 24 hours of age, um, but it has to be done before they are discharged from the facility. So when we're looking at the nursing admission assessment, in reality, what you are looking at is a very thorough head to toe assessment and you're looking at all body systems. So the way I'm presenting this information to you is a head to toe assessment as well as body systems. I'm kind of integrating both um, so that you can see what the nurse is assessing for. In addition, you're um, going to be looking at their reflexes and their sensory information, um, any symptom that the baby is having difficulty in adapting, any neurological symptoms. And keep in mind, babies should respond to you touching them so they should respond to a uh, touch in addition we're going to um, in addition to the admission assessment the registered nurse is going to also uh, observe the baby's nutritional status make sure the baby has the ability to breastfeed or bottle feed we're going to make sure that the baby is um, holding its own body temperature. I know that doesn't seem like a big deal, but for newborns transitioning to an external uterine environment, that is a big deal. And some babies have a lot of trouble holding their own temperature. So we're going to monitor their thermoregulation needs. Um, we're going to check basically every body system and how they're responding. So before you start any type of assessment on a brand new baby, I tell students that you need to put on uh, gloves before the because this baby hasn't had its first bath yet. And even though they're cute, they're covered in body secretions and body fluids so they can have um, infectious illnesses that can be transmitted to someone else. And then when we're doing this assessment, we're going to uh, obviously assess for any obvious problems first. If the baby is stable and they don't require any inter um, immediate intervention um, and there's no obvious problems, then we're going to 
continue with the complete head to toe assessment. Obviously, if the baby has a respiratory problem or a cardiac problem, we may delay doing the head to toe to address their respiratory and cardiopulmonary needs. On you, any obvious anomalies that stand out to you, any visible or non visible, we're going to assess for those and we're going to constantly watch for symptoms of infant stabilization. And this is why I showed you this picture to explain to students, this is why you wear gloves. Even though this is a cute little baby, they're covered in body secretion. So you're going to wash your hands and put on gloves, um, the, the disposable gloves, when we are doing a head to toe assessment. You usually start your assessments with doing a general survey, just kind of looking at the baby, and then you're going to progress to looking at their vital signs. Now, I tell students that you usually start with the non-invasive vital signs first, like um, listening to their heart rate or in their respiratory rate, and then progressing to their temperature because the temperature uh, uh, probe tends to irritate them a little bit, so they'll start to cry, and then it'll make it harder for you to assess your um your respiratory or cardiac uh, portions to your vital sign assessment. So when you're assessing your newborn baby's vital signs, you are going to auscultate their heart rate and you're going to auscultate their respiratory rate. Um, and you, I tell students to kind of position yourself under, you know, a clock or where you can uh, watch a second hand, either a watch or um, with a clock and you're going to, um, count for a full minute. That's a textbook suggested and NCLEX suggested number. Will you see nurses doing a full minute? They, all of them don't, but we really should because the baby, the newborn baby's um, cardiopulmonary system is, a, is irregular as they transition to um, meeting those needs on their own. So their heart rate can be a little bit irregular um, and their respiratory rate can be a you know, a little regular, but you're going to um, listen to their pulse for a full minute and you're going to count their respirations. You're going to look for anything that stands out that tells you that this baby is in respiratory distress, such as tachypnea, nasal flaring, any grunting or retractions. You're going to watch your baby's color, watch your baby's tone, watch their reflexes, and note if you see any um, symptoms of instability. Most hospitals have a protocol as to how often a newborn baby's vital signs are assessed after delivery. And so what you're going to see typically somewhere in this kind of um, range is you're going to see vital signs checked every 15 minutes times four. And that's usually for the first hour, but you're going to still follow your hospital's protocol. So if your hospital's protocol is every 20 minutes, then you would do it every 20 minutes. You just follow the hospital's protocol um, as it's delineated. Um, and then it usually progresses to every 30 minutes times two, which is another hour. And then the, the third one is usually done on the postpartum floor, but it'll be every 60 minutes times two for two hours. But you follow your hospital's protocols uh, based on um, the the needs that they feel that the baby has in assessing their transition. You're also going to assess, while you're doing your vital signs, it's just constantly in the back of your head, assessing the you know, the state of their cardiopulmonary respiratory status. Um, and there's some things that you can review that can tell you, you know, what might have occurred before this baby's delivery. So you're going to review the history of the pregnancy and the labor and delivery. Um, were there any medications that were administered? Was the mother given any narcotics or medications in labor that can affect the baby's cardiopulmonary status? Um, because some meds can... Uh, can make the baby appear as to it'll make them look like their their central nervous system and respirations are depressed like if they got an, a narcotic or an opioid um you're going to monitor their, their their respiratory rate make sure they have a patent airway and monitor them for symptoms of respiratory distress watch their color and you're going to watch their temperature these are symptoms of respiratory distress to kind of keep in the back of your mind when you're doing your vital signs and your assessment as they're transitioning. Do you see any tachypnea, any retractions, any nasal flaring? Um, do they have cyanosis or, 
uh, pallor. Keep in mind, acrocyanosis is a color change. You'll see it in the hands and feet of the newborn baby. Um, it usually happens when the baby is a little chilled, but it's a normal finding um, the first 24, 48 hours after birth. It's common in the, the neonatal period, but if it persists and it continues, um, th then it may not be a normal finding. It may be an issue. So, um, but we, we don't want a baby to become cold, but you do tend to see it when they're a little on the, the cooler side. You also assess them for grunting, seesaw respirations, or any color changes. You are going to auscultate their, um, I told you their vital sign, their heart rate for a full minute. Um, and you're going to look for presence of abnormal um, uh, you know, lung sounds. Um, you want to call, count for a full minute. Keep in mind that if this baby was born by C-section or born precipitously, which means rapidly, their lung sounds may be more moist than others. You also are going to check your brachial and femoral pulses. Um, we don't routinely do blood pressures on newborn babies um, unless they suspect there's a cardiac issue. And then if you have to do them, they're usually done on all four extremities. But it's not common because we don't usually do blood pressures on newborn babies. Remember I said to you that thermal regulation is extremely important in the newborn period so you're going to assess their body temperature and make sure that it's within normal range. Um, 36.5 to 37.5 is normal range. The first temperature that is assessed is no longer done rectally. They should be done axillarily because of the risk of, of harming the newborn baby's rectal tissue. So they are not done rectally. They are done uh, by axillary method. I've given you the symptoms that this baby might be in trouble as we transition, but this is kind of in your general management before we actually lay, um, you know, before we lay hands on the baby. Let me move this because I didn't know that it covered the uh, page. So when you're doing your head to toe assessment, now you're going to want to do this in an orderly fashion and you're going to progress from the head to the feet. You're going to want to make sure you have adequate lighting and you want to make sure that the baby doesn't become cold. So when we do this assessment, we normally put the baby under what's called a radiant warmer and it gets, it will keep the baby very warm while we, uh, you know, take their clothing off of them so that we can do a thorough, complete nursing assessment and they're not cold. You want to make sure that you have adequate lighting and visualization so that you can, you know, give a proper assessment. And I usually tell nursing students, you want to make sure you have your, your pen light because you're going to use your pen light as a part of your assessment. The first thing I want to tell you, and you can notice this when you're approaching a newborn baby, is look at the newborn baby's tone. You can see two babies here, a baby that's on your left and a baby that's on your right. When you look at the baby on the left, what you, what I want you to notice is this very open posture, which is a symptom of decreased tone. Term healthy newborn babies have very good tone to them and they can hold their little arms and legs into space. Um, but a baby who's born preterm or baby who's having difficulty transitioning will have what's called a very open posture. Um, and they'll have a very floppy tone. Sometimes it's, you, you can almost imagine it being like a rag doll. Um, and that's not what we want to see. We want a baby to have good tone to them. So the baby that's here on your left, this is a baby that has a decreased flexion, decreased tone. And that decreased muscle tone is can be a, it, many times a symptom is telling to how this baby is transitioning. Um, so decreased tone um, is not it's not considered a good finding in your um, your transition, the baby transitioning to the external uterine environment. The baby is going to undergo a, a color change. This is a baby that's probably like 1.2 seconds old. <laughs> um, but this is the color that the newborn baby has. And then they're going to very rapidly transition. Their color is going to change and their color should be, uh, very pink. And if you see this baby on your right, if you kind of draw an imaginary oval around this baby's body, you'll see that this baby has a nice pink color to them. Um, it, the nice, um, pink color centrally, um, which tells you that this baby's um, um, 
circulatory system is functioning well and the baby's well oxygenated. But if you look at this baby to the top left, you'll notice this baby is more pale in color compared to the baby on the right. And the baby that's on the bottom, you'll notice the hands and feet are more of a bluish purplish color. That's the acrocyanosis um, that you can uh, see. And it is a common thing to see in newborn babies because their circulatory system is transitioning. Um, this baby has central cyanosis. So the color that kind of ashen gray bluish color that you see centrally, this is telling you that this baby is not uh, having good cardiopulmonary function. So we would need to do some um, supportive measures to try to address this. So you look at the color, you look at the tone, you look at the posture, and then and you look at the color. Now we're going to start our head to toe assessment. So you start with assessing this the baby's head, and not only you're going to look at it, but you're going to palpate it. And you'll notice that this baby has what we call as molding. This baby's head is kind of pointed kind of reminds you of a cone head if you're old enough to remember that TV show. That's a normal finding in the newborn baby. What you want to remember is that the, the bones and the plates in the baby's head are not calcified. Um, and that's good because it allows the babies, the bones in the baby's head, which is the largest part of the baby's body, to adapt and, and change and mold to the shape and size of mom's pelvis. So the longer this baby's head is down in mom's a bony pelvis, the more molded their head will be. And this isn't something that's permanent. Give the baby a couple days to a week and the bones in the baby's head will move back and go into a normal position and will no longer reflect molding. So not only are you going to look at the baby's head, but you're going to palpate the baby's head. You want to remember that the baby's head is the largest part of the baby's uh, body. In addition to, to uh, palpating and looking at it, we're also going to measure it, but we'll talk about those measurements a little bit later. You're going to palpate their head. You're going to assess to see if you see any bruising or edema. And keep in mind, molding allows for passage of the baby's um, head through the mom's bony birth canal. Um, you're also going to assess the baby's fontanelles and that's the area where the sutures are met and they're not calcified um, are not hard so it's kind of like the soft spots on the baby's head the baby has two fontanelles they have an anterior one which is the larger of the two and then the posterior one which is a smaller more triangles shaped um, fontanelle at the base of the baby's head and you can really see on this in this picture you see the fontanelle here but you can also see the suture lines and those suture lines not only you're going to look at them but you're going to palpate them so when you're assessing the baby's head follow the suture lines note if you see any molding or any overriding sutures that are noted and this is showing you how the the bones in the baby's head move and how they adapt and mold to the shape of mom's pelvis. So this is how the bones moved in the picture A and then picture B is how after a week the, the bones move back to their normal position. You'll note in this picture this baby has what's called overriding sutures. It kind of looks like a speed bump on this baby's head. Remember I said to you that the plates in the baby's head are not calcified so one bony plate can move and ride over another bony plate so they're called overriding sutures. This is a normal finding but it's still an assessment finding so you would document this on your nor newborn assessment documentation. Now you will not remember every abnormal suture line but you will note as a nurse if you this this is not a normal finding so I wouldn't expect students to go home and try to remember all of these different names that are on this page what I would expect you to note that this is what a normal one looks like versus that this is not normal you expect to have um, the normal suture lines on the baby's head and not you know where they're calcified on one side and not on the other that would be something that would be abnormal and we would you know obviously document that and report that to the pediatrician.
So um, as we continue with the head, you're going to um, assess their suture lines and their fontanelles. Remember that they have two fontanelles. The anterior fontanelle, which is the larger of the two, usually closes by the time the baby's 18 months of age, and the posterior fontanelle usually closes by the time the baby is two to three months of age. The, the fontanelles should be soft and flat. They shouldn't be depressed. They should not be bulging, okay? Um, and it is normal to feel the uh, pulse and the baby's fontanelles, you can feel their heartbeat. That's a normal finding, but the fontanelles shouldn't be bulging or depressed. Um, the babies can have some um, uh, symptoms of edema on the baby's head, and there's different types of this. The baby can have what's called a caput sesodineum. Nurses don't usually um, say the entire name. They usually abbreviate it, so they will call it a caput. But this is an area of edema over the presenting part of the baby's head, resulting from pressure against the cervix in the baby's head during labor and delivery. And so basically what you want to think about is a caput is soft tissue bruising. So they're going to have an area of ecchymosis and edema and caput's cross suture lines so um, they can have a cap uh, a caput on you know any portion of the baby's head it basically a soft tissue bruising and it usually disappears in a couple days usually within three to four days um, it's gone they can this is a caput okay and remember I told you caput's cross suture lines because it's soft tissue uh, bruising soft tissue bleeding um, caputs can also, they can have a small caput or they can have a significant caput where you actually have um, pitting where they, where it will leave an area of indentation. Um, but again, caputs are soft tissue uh, bleeding. The baby can have in a, can have what is called a cephalohematoma and this is different from a caput. Same idea, there's a lot of pressure um, that is put on this baby's head during the course of delivery and repeated uh, pressure. Um, and it can cause a little bit of bleeding between the periosteum, uh, which is the lining of the skull, and the skull itself. So it's bleeding between the lining of the, the bone and the bone uh, uh, in the head. And that is hard tissue bleeding. This isn't soft tissue bleeding. And anything that's hard tissue bleeding is going to take a lot longer to resolve. So a cephalohematoma can take up to five weeks to heal. So because it's hard tissue bleeding, cephalohematomas do not cross suture lines. So the baby, you can see in this picture, the baby has a large cephalohematoma here and then a soft, a small, excuse me, cephalohematoma here but it doesn't cross suture lines so the baby has two of them this baby has two of them as well you have one here and then you have a little one here but they don't cross suture lines so the cephalohematoma is bleeding between um, the lining of the bone itself and the bone so it's hard tissue bleeding and then the baby can have another type of bleeding this is more um, uncommon. Cephalohematomas and caputs are more common than a subgaleal hematoma. Um, it's, this isn't as common, but I have seen it and it is, um, it, it can be lethal to a newborn baby and it has to do with the amount of bleeding. So basically the blood vessels, um, underneath the scalp, um, rupture and it's the blood vessels that also connect the frontal lobe, the frontal and occipital components of, uh, the frontal uh, muscle. And so basically they can have bleeding underneath the entire scalp and it can actually in a severe bleed can dissect into their neck. So this is, more commonly associated with a vacuum uh, assisted delivery. Again, this is a r more rare. It's not as commonly seen, but it can be pretty serious. So if the baby has this, th they're going to go to NICU. They're not going to stay on the newborn um, in the newborn nursery or on the postpartum floor. But when you're looking at a subgaleal hematoma, there, it can affect the entire scalp. In addition, what I tell students too is usually if you have an area of bru bruising or bleeding, it doesn't move. But when you see a subgaleal hematoma, it can move because it's, it's, it's fluid and it's under their scalp. So if the baby has this, this baby is, is going to NICU.
Um, you remember that the the fontanelle should be flat they shouldn't be bulging and this is a bulging fontanelle so this would be um, an abnormal finding and it can be a symptom of increased intracranial pressure in your newborn baby so this would be something that we you know would need to report to the pediatrician um, you also want to assess for abnormal um, abnormal head size before um, when I used to teach this to students they would look at me like I was speaking Greek but once you know Zika virus was all over the news students came to understand the term microcephaly and it stands for uh, micro if you remember learning um, if you took a class that taught to you about um, medical terminology or, or medical words micro means small cephaly means head so basically it's telling you that this baby has uh, an underdeveloped head under a, a small smaller than normal head and if you have an underdeveloped head that means you're going to have a smaller underdeveloped brain um, so does this baby have microcephaly and that can be um, indicative of a chromosomal abnormality Babies can also have what's called plagiocephaly, and that has to, to do with the bones in their head. You know, they're not calcified. Um, so sometimes in utero, the baby can become wedged in a certain position, and they remain in that position for a longer period of time so the bones in their head may move so they can have a misshapen head or um, if, if you leave babies after they're born on the, their backs for a long period of time they can develop a flattened portion of their head also uh, plagiocephaly is because the bones in their their head aren't calcified yet um, so do you see a, a misshapen head um, if it is positional um, which this is where you have to be careful because sometimes it's if it's positional it's not due to a chromosomal abnormality but if it's not positional it can be a symptom of a chromosomal abnormality so does the baby have a normal shaped skull and head or do they have a distorted shaped head or an unusually misshapen uh, shaped head Babies can be born with hydrocephalus, which is fluid um, in their head, um, and you'll get into this more in the pediatric component, but it's fluid on the brain, and this can be um, a medical situation that has to be acted on because it can cause uh, brain damage to your your newborn baby. So um, do they have hydrocephalus? Also, I know this doesn't sound like a big symptom but it can be and that is if babies have what's known as abnormal whorls of hair so they have these unusual uh, hair patterns that can be a symptom of a chromosomal abnormality we're going to look at some other symptoms of chromosomal abnormalities in the newborn baby as we progress but abnormal hair patterns can be a symptom on the baby's head of of, of an abnormality so i'll be giving you a chance to to uh, review or apply some of the stuff that we went over this is a pop question based on what you learned thus far what it what is this that you're looking at what is this condition if you said a cephalohematoma you would be right and the baby has two of them um, and so this would be um, obviously it's not something that we we would document it it's an assessment finding um, it's bleeding on the uh, heart tissue of the bones in the baby's uh, skull and it can take up to five weeks to heal so I'm gonna stop for this point this is part one and then the next component is gonna start part two of our um, our presentation <music>